Okay, so uh, if you ever have any questions on whether or not an article is suitable, uh, please feel free to contact me. Um, it's not due for two and a half weeks, but I would suggest starting sooner rather than later. Uh, and in my experience, uh, the best way to write a good summary is to select a good article. So take some time to make sure that you find an article that you're interested in. The more interested you are in the article, uh, the, the more likely you are to write a high quality summary, okay? Uh, so this assignment uh, should help you learn to browse the uh, chemistry literature, which is a vital skill for chemists. Uh, and it will also expose you to some of the uh, exciting cutting edge research that is being done in 2020 uh, based on organic chemistry, okay? All right, so another announcement, we're going to have a quiz on Monday. Uh, so make sure you're prepared for that. Uh, we're going to come close to finishing chapter nine today. We won't quite finish epoxides. We'll finish that off after our quiz on Monday. Uh, but anything from chapter nine uh, that we get to today, uh, back to where we started on chapter nine, uh, could, be, uh, could be on the quiz. So today we'll focus on uh, alkyl tosylates uh, and why they're important. Uh, we'll talk about uh, reactions of ethers. Then we'll talk about thiols and sulfides, which are cousins to alcohols and ethers. They're sulfur-containing compounds. And then uh, we'll start, uh, but uh, not finish our discussion of epoxides. So on Wednesday, we were talking about how to convert alcohols into alkyl halides. Okay. Uh, and, of course, we learned that with HX, there are some drawbacks. We have uh, rearrangements that occur because we form carbocations. We have racemization that can occur. <clears throat> and so uh, chemists have devised uh, uh, an alternative method using thionyl chloride uh, to convert alcohols to alkyl halides uh, by an SN2 process. Uh, so there's no rearrangements. Uh, there's clean inversion of the stereochemistry. Uh, there's also a way of converting alcohols into bromides, and that uses phosphorus tribromide, or PBr3. And I've drawn for you the mechanism here on the board. It's similar to the ones we've seen with uh, thionyl chloride and phosphorus oxychloride. Uh, we have a phosphorus atom with three bonds to more electronegative atoms. So that phosphorus is quite electrophilic, electrophilic enough <clears throat> that the weakly nucleophilic alcohol can attack it. Uh, and then we displace a bromide in the process. And then in the second step, the bromide comes in in the SN2 process, uh, displacing, breaking the carbon oxygen bond, displacing the leaving group and giving us the alkyl bromide. Okay? Uh, so one difference between this and the thionyl chloride reaction is we don't need to deprotonate uh, the alcohol, uh, so we don't need base in this reaction. Um, we can just use uh, the bromide directly. Um, what would happen to the stereochemistry if we had a chiral alcohol reacting in this process? Yes. It would invert, exactly. So this is an SN2 process. So like thionyl chloride, uh, it would undergo an inversion process, okay? So we have this uh, table here uh, that summarizes uh, all these methods that we've learned uh, for forming alkyl halides uh, from alcohols. Uh, and we know that um, because the PBR3 reaction and the thionyl chloride reaction are um, SN2 reactions, they're only gonna work with primary and secondary alcohols. They're not going to work with tertiary alcohols. So with tertiary alcohols, uh, we would use uh, HCl, HBr, or HI, um, but we probably wouldn't see rearrangements with tertiary alcohols because they're already forming stable carbocations, okay? So any questions about uh, alcohols to alkyl halides? And these are important reactions because alkyl halide, alcohols are very common starting materials available from nature, and alkyl halides are very useful 
uh, in uh, substitution and elimination reactions to make a variety of types of compounds. Uh, but there's something related to uh, alkyl halides that we can form from alcohols. Those are called alkyl tosylates. Okay. Uh, and these are related to tosic acid or toluene sulfonic acid. We've talked about that a little bit. Uh, so we use the abbreviation TS to indicate a tosyl group. A tosyl group is a sulfonyl group. And it looks like this. So the squiggly line here is indicating that the sulfur is then bonded to whatever uh, is uh, attached to the TS, the tosyl group. So an alkyl tosylate uh, would look like this. It would have an alkyl group, and then you would write OTS. Uh, and so what that would mean is you'd have your alkyl group, you'd have your oxygen, and then that oxygen is bonded to the sulfur. Okay? So that's what a tosylate looks like. So these are excellent leaving groups. Question. The tosylate, so, so TS means this. So the benzene with the sulfur is part of it. So tosyl stands for toluene sulfonyl. We'll learn next semester that this thing, when you have a benzene ring with a methyl group, that's called toluene. So that's where the name comes from, toluene sulfonyl. We abbreviate it as tosyl. And so tosyl is this. A tosylate has an oxygen in it. So OTS would be tosylate. So when we talk about a tosylate, we would write OTS. And then, we, and then that would mean this, okay? And this is an excellent leaving group. The conjugate acid of this leaving group is toluene sulfonic acid, which we referred to as TSOH back in chapter two. Uh, and we've also used it in this chapter for dehydrations. We know that that's a strong acid. The pKa of toluene sulfonic acid is about seven, I believe. Uh, so that makes tosylates uh, comparable to iodides in terms of their leaving group ability. Uh, and so the way we form them is by reacting an alcohol with tosyl chloride or toluene sulfonyl chloride. We could take methanol, or sorry, ethanol. We can react it with tosyl chloride, which we would draw this way. We're going to use pyridine, which we've seen before. That's going to give us our tosylate. It's going to give us a pyridinium cation that just forms a salt uh, with uh, chloride uh, as a byproduct. Okay. So we'll look at the mechanism uh, of this uh, reaction. Uh, and it involves steps that we've seen before. Uh, nothing new. I'm going to show the mechanism using a chiral alcohol here, secondary alcohol that's chiral, uh, to illustrate some important stereochemistry uh, that's involved uh, with this process. Okay? So, toluene sulfonyl chloride, it looks similar to thionyl chloride, but instead of having two chlorines, we replaced one of them with this uh, aromatic group. Okay? Uh, but that sulfur is still very electrophilic. It has five bonds to more electronegative atoms. So like thionyl chloride, like phosphorus oxychloride, like phosphorus tribromide, this sulfur is electrophilic enough because of all those electronegative atoms and polar bonds that the weak nucleophile of the alcohol can attack that sulfur and displace the chloride, okay? So we're gonna displace the chloride. We're going to generate an oxonium ion. And let me, I forgot to draw the rest of the structure here, okay? So we generate this intermediate, this oxonium ion, 
and we've seen this with thionyl chloride, phosphorus oxychloride, uh, our pyridine base will come in and deprotonate that oxonium ion, uh, and that's going to give us our product. and the pyridinium ion that simply forms a salt with the chloride ion that was formed earlier, okay? So substitution on the sulfur followed by a proton transfer using the pyridine, that gives us our tosylate, okay? Uh, so this is identical to the first two steps that happen when an alcohol reacts with thionyl chloride. The difference is we don't have a third step. We don't have the chloride come in and displace the tosylate in a third step. You might wonder why that doesn't happen, because I just told you this is a good leaving group and this is a strong nucleophile, okay? The answer is it can happen. You can run these reactions for longer times or higher temperatures and you could get the chloride, okay? Uh, but you can also stop it at the tosylate. And there are reasons why you want to stop it at the tosylate that we'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. So because you can stop this reaction either by keeping the temperature low or, or the reaction time short, because you can stop it at this stage, it's more useful for a certain purpose than the thionyl chloride reaction is, which is always going to go to the chloride, okay? One difference is when you remember with thionyl chloride, when the chloride came in, the leaving group could fragment or break apart, and it could give you uh, SO2, and it could give you chloride. Uh, and so we said that that was thermodynamically favorable. Uh, you can't do that here with the tosylate. There's no way uh, to have a nucleophile come in and break that up and give you the SO2 and so forth. So it, it doesn't uh, fall apart as soon as it's made uh, the same way as the, the intermediate and the thionyl chloride reaction does. Okay. So with uh, toluene sulfonyl chloride, usually we're going to stop at the tosylate. With thionyl chloride, we're going to form the chloride, okay? So why would we go to the trouble of making a tosylate? Now, we already have alkyl halides that are good leaving groups. The answer to that question uh, lies in what I've shown you here on the board, okay? We, we have a chiral alcohol forming a chiral tosylate. What happens to the stereochemistry of the alcohol as we convert it to the tosylates? It's the same, it's retained, okay? So previously when we formed uh, alkyl halides from alcohols, we would either racemize the stereochemistry if we used HX, or we would invert the stereochemistry if we used thionyl chloride or PBr3. So the tosylate is unique in that it allows us to convert an alcohol into a leaving group with retention of the alcohol stereochemistry, okay? And that is useful. To explore how that's useful, let's get out our eye clickers. Yes. So the stereochemistry here, we haven't figured it out, but it's, it's gonna be S, okay? So we have S here. Uh, and then we have S over here. Uh, so we have the same, we haven't inverted it. We, that's a good question. We have not broken the carbon oxygen bond. So the stereochemistry stays the same. None of our steps have involved this center, right? They, they, this carbon has not participated in any reactions. This carbon oxygen bond has remained intact uh, as we formed our leaving group. All of our other ways of making leaving groups have broken that carbon oxygen bond. So that's how, that was a good question. All right, so go ahead and talk to your neighbors. Uh, and this might remind you of a question we had on the test that was one of the hardest questions on the test. Uh, but um, uh, which of the following four methods would be the best way of converting this alcohol into this azide? And please pay close attention to the stereochemistry.
All right, uh, I'm hearing some good stereochemistry discussions here. Let's try to uh, finish up and get our final answers in the next uh, few seconds. Okay, any more answers out there? Okay, going once. There's another one. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, close it off now. All right, so there was a lot of debate between a couple of choices here. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go through this. So our, our starting material is trans. The OH and the methyl group are trans to each other. And in our product, the methyl group and the azide are also trans to each other, okay? So let's think backwards. Uh, if we're going to make this azide, we're going to have to perform a substitution reaction. And it's going to be best if we, if we want to control the stereochemistry, we want to do an SN2 reaction, okay? So if we're going to perform an SN2 reaction to make uh, a species where the nucleophile is trans to the methyl group, What's the stereochemistry of the leaving group need to be? Cis, okay? So we're gonna have to have an intermediate that has a leaving group cis to the methyl group, okay? Now the OH group is trans, so as we go from the alcohol to the species with the leaving group, we're going to have to invert the stereochemistry, okay? So which of these methods will cleanly invert the stereochemistry as we convert the alcohol into a leaving group? Yeah, A, PBR3 is going to invert the stereochemistry as we convert the alcohol to the bromide, okay? So if we do two consecutive inversions, it's the same thing as retaining the stereochemistry. Any questions about that? All right, so uh, some of you uh, might have missed that question, uh, so we'll give you a chance to redeem yourselves. We have a second question. Yes? The answer is right here. In this step, this step is SN2. When you cleave that carbon oxygen bond and form the carbon bromine bond, that's an inversion process. So that's, that, that's how it inverts it. Okay. So our second question that you have, now we're converting this trans alcohol into the cis azide. We have the same four choices. Uh, go ahead and, let's see, I haven't started that yet, sorry. Let me open that up for you. Go ahead and choose which of those four choices would be the best way of making this compound. Okay, let's uh, finish up. Just a couple more seconds. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop that. 
All right, uh, B was definitely the most popular choice. Would someone like to raise their hand and explain why B is the best way to accomplish this transformation? Yes, please. Tossel chloride. Good. Okay, very good. So we want to accomplish a net inversion. So as we convert our alcohol to a leaving group, we need to retain the stereochemistry because we know it will invert in the substitution step. So we have to use toluene sulfonyl chloride or tosyl chloride to do that. It will not invert the stereochemistry. We're not touching that carbon oxygen bond as we convert that alcohol into a good leaving group. Uh, and then when we do our second step and invert it, uh, we can get the desired product. Okay, question. Okay. So what happens when you use HBr? What happens to the stereochemistry? It'll racemize because you'll have a carbon cation. So you would get a mixture of inversion and retention. And that would allow you to get some of this compound, but it would be mixed in with the trans isomer. So that's why we have the word best in the, in the question here. This is the one, I'm glad you asked that. So this is the one where with tertiary and secondary alcohols, it's SN1. It's only SN2 with primary alcohols, which is kind of confusing. I addressed that on Wednesday and said that that's, that, that, that's not very intuitive, uh, that the SN2 process is slower than the SN1. But that's the case here. And because of that, we see racemization there. So that's, that's why this is not as good of a choice as that. Okay. Uh, and then the problem with D uh, is we need to convert the OH group into a leaving group first before we can perform the substitution. Okay. Any other questions? So these two, these two eye clicker questions show you why tosylates are useful. So if we had this alcohol as our starting material and we wanted the trans product, we could use the tosylate. We could get 100% of the trans product. If we wanted the, or the cis product, sorry. If we wanted the trans product, we could use PBR3 uh, orthoinyl chloride and we could get 100% of the trans product, right? So by choosing the right method of converting our alcohol into a leaving group, either with 100% retention of the stereochemistry or 100% inversion of the stereochemistry, uh, we can get the stereoisomer that we want. Okay, so that's, that's why it's useful. Okay, question, Minnie? Yes, yes, it's the same abbreviation. So TSOH, if your R was a hydrogen and we had a hydrogen there, that would be TSOH. That would be the structure of that uh, acid. Okay, so let's talk about ethers now. Uh, and ethers are less reactive than alcohols. They're more sterically hindered. They have two alkyl groups. Uh, the one reaction we're going to see uh, with ethers is reaction with HX to make alkyl halides. Okay, so we've already seen that with alcohols to make alkyl halides. The difference with ethers is we have two alkyl groups in an ether instead of just one. So we're going to get two alkyl halides. And if it's an unsymmetrical ether, we would get two different alkyl halides. And we would need two equivalents of our HX for this reaction. Because ethers are less reactive than alcohols, we, need, we can only use HBr or HI in this reaction. Okay? Uh, and then the mechanism is going to depend on whether the alkyl groups are primary, secondary, or tertiary. Okay, much like uh, in response to that question you asked, I reminded you that uh, primary alcohols react by SN2 mechanisms with HX, secondary and tertiary react by SN1. We'll see a similar pattern with ethers. So let's take an unsymmetrical ether. This is our tert butyl methyl ether, the one that was used as a uh, gasoline additive. And we're gonna react that with HI. Okay, and it shouldn't surprise you at this point 
that the first step is going to be protonation of the oxygen. Okay, that should be familiar. And we're generating iodide, and then we're generating an oxonium ion. Okay. All right, so uh, what's going to happen next? And think about the reactions with alcohols and HX. Give you an idea of what happens next. Yes, Claire. Okay, so uh, we now have a good leaving group here, a protonated oxygen and oxonium. So it can leave. If it leaves, what are we going to have as an intermediate? Carbocation. So um, now we have, with an alcohol, we just had one carbon oxygen bond to cleave. Here we have a choice. Which carbon oxygen bond are we going to cleave in this case? The one to the more substituted group, because that will give us the more substituted carbocation. So in this particular case, it's going to be the one to the tert butyl group, giving us our tertiary carbocation. Uh, and then we're going to form methanol. Okay, And then our tertiary carbocation is going to react with our iodide that we formed in the uh, first step. And that's going to give us one of our alkyl halides. Okay. So the reaction of ethers with, with HX is a two-part process. We form one alkyl halide in the first part, and then we form an alcohol. And then in the second part, we simply convert that alcohol into an alkyl halide. And we've already learned the mechanism for that. So we have our methanol. That's going to react with a second equivalent of HI. Okay. This time, we cannot form a carbocation. A methyl carbocation would be even higher in energy than a primary carbocation. So that's not going to happen. Uh, but our iodide that we generated can perform an SN2 process, giving us iodomethane uh, and then forming our water byproduct. Okay. So two parts. Uh, and the two parts can have the same mechanism or different mechanisms, depending on the type of alkyl groups. We chose an example here where the two parts would have different mechanisms. The first part was SN1, the second part was SN2, just so that you could see how both of those would be drawn, okay? Questions? Yes? Yes, so we learned, uh, we learned on Wednesday uh, that HCl, in these reactions with HX, uh, the stronger acids react faster and we learned that primary alcohols have to have that uh, extra Lewis acid, the zinc chloride, to react with HCl. And because ethers are less reactive than primary alcohols, the, then they won't react at all with HCl. Okay. So uh, we have a summary that I should have shown you before we showed you the uh, reactions with ethers. Uh, this is just a, a summary here showing you all the reactions we learned of alcohols. Uh, and I wish they would have shown stereochemistry here because if they had taken an example with stereochemistry, you'd see why the tosyl chloride is different from the thionyl chloride or PBR3. But that's still a helpful table uh, to, to remind you uh, of the reactions uh, that we've learned. So let's talk about sulfur containing compounds. Okay? Uh, we have sulfides, or sorry, we'll start with thiols. Thiols are the sulfur-containing analogs of alcohols. They have an SH instead of an OH. The nomenclature is the same, you just have thiol instead of all. Okay? Uh, a key difference in the properties of thiols and alcohols uh, is that thiols cannot engage in hydrogen bonds. The sulfur is not as electronegative as oxygen. The sulfur-hydrogen bond is not as polar, uh, and therefore there's no hydrogen bonding in thiols. So the boiling points of alcohols are higher than the boiling points of thiols. Okay. You would form a thiol, 
from an SN2 reaction, starting with an alkyl halide, you would just use SH- minus as your nucleophile. And we saw that as a nucleophile in Chapter 7. A key difference between thiols and alcohols is that thiols can be oxidized with bromine or iodine to form disulfides. This is referred to as an oxidation because we're losing hydrogens from our starting material. In this case, we're dimerizing our starting material to make this disulfide. Okay? Uh, this is a very important reaction in biochemistry. There are amino acids that contain thiols in the side chains, uh, and they can react with a thiol from another amino acid side chain in a protein, making a disulfide bond that then makes the uh, peptide or the protein very rigid and gives it a very well-defined uh, three-dimensional structure. So disulfide bonds are very common in nature, and nature is using other oxidants than bromine or iodine. That's what we would use in uh, a flask. Uh, different oxidants would be used in a cell. Okay? Uh, and then you can also reverse the process. You can reduce a disulfide, adding hydrogen, using zinc as the reducing agent, uh, and HCl as the source of the proton. We're not going to learn the mechanisms for these reactions. We will study oxidations and reductions in more detail in Chapter 12. Uh, but what we'll learn is that oxidations and reductions sometimes have more complicated mechanisms than some of our other reactions. Okay? So this will be a rare example of a case where we're just going to learn the reagents and we're going to learn the products that those reagents give. We're not actually going to learn the mechanism. But this is an important reaction. Both of these reactions are important in biochemistry. It's common to form disulfides to make proteins more rigid. It's also common to break disulfides to make them more flexible. Question? So it makes a ring. If you have them in the same molecule, uh, if you have two, two thiols in the same molecule and you form a disulfide, by forming that disulfide, you've made a ring. And we've learned that by making rings, you reduce the flexibility. So that's a good question. That's how it does it. Yes? This one doesn't. I'm just talking about in nature. Okay, this is, this is one where they're just showing you a simple thiol making a dimer. But if you had a molecule with two thiols and they reacted together to make a disulfide, that's where you would get the ring. And that's what happens in nature. You have proteins that have multiple thiols, and you can make rings using disulfides. Uh, we'll actually talk about that more in 352, towards the end of the semester. Uh, if you've ever gone to a beauty salon and gotten a perm before, they've done both of these reactions on your hair uh, using milder oxidants. They're not putting HCl on your hair. Uh, but they use both of those reactions in the process of giving you a perm. And we'll actually explain that way, way, way at the end of the semester. Uh, in the winter, something to look forward to. All right, so the sulfur analog of an ether is called a sulfide. Uh, and we said that you made ethers using the Williamson ether synthesis. Uh, we can make sulfides in the same way. We would just use the conjugate base of a thiol as opposed to the conjugate base of an alcohol as our nucleophile. So sulfides differ from ethers in that the sulfur is more nucleophilic than the oxygen of an ether. Sulfur is a larger atom than oxygen. The outer shell of electrons is further away from the nucleus. So the lone pairs on the sulfur are more reactive. And so what this means is that a sulfide is right on the border between a strong nucleophile and a weak nucleophile. Whereas you would say an ether is a weak nucleophile, a sulfide is a strong enough nucleophile that it can participate in SN2 reactions, but only with primary alkyl halides. Okay? So if we had a sulfide, right, we could call this dipropyl sulfide. Uh, we could react that with a primary alkyl halide, and we would have an SN2 reaction. And what we would get is a sulfonium salt. Okay? We'd have a positive charge on sulfur. 
and then our bromide would be our anion. This only works with primary alkyl halides, because these are right on the fence between strong and weak nucleophiles. <clears throat> with secondary alkyl halides, it won't work. This is also an important process in biochemistry. Back in chapter 7, we learned about S-adenosylmethionine, uh, which is nature's version of iodomethane. Uh, this is S-adenosylmethionine, shown on the right on this slide. A sulfonium is a good leaving group. Uh, and so we said that uh, uh, in biochemistry, when we want to perform an SN2 reaction and attach a methyl group to a nucleophile, we use S-adenosylmethionine. So the way S-adenosylmethionine is made in our bodies is a sulfide. Methionine is an amino acid that has a sulfide in the side chain. That's going to attack ATP, which you pr probably know is an energy source, but it also has a good leaving group here. The triphosphate group is a good leaving group, and it's primary. So we have an SN2 reaction here, and that gives us S-adenosylmethionine, uh, which we now know can participate in other SN2 reactions where the nucleophile attacks the methyl group. So this reaction over here, also used in biochemistry. Okay. Questions about thiols and sulfides? Yes. That's the extent, yes. Yes, we don't have a whole lot of time, unfortunately, to go into thiols and sulfides. Okay, so let's talk about epoxides now. And we said that epoxides, while they are a type of ether, they have their own special reactivity due to the fact that they have a lot of ring strain. That ring strain and the ability to relieve that ring strain in a substitution reaction allows epoxides to be much more reactive than other types of ethers. So epoxides will react with strong nucleophiles in ring opening reactions. So I'll draw an epoxide for you here. <clears throat> and this epoxide is going to react with a strong nucleophile. The one we're choosing as our example is methoxide. Uh, and that's going to be an SN2 process, this nucleophile attacking this epoxide, breaking one of those carbon-oxygen bonds in an SN2 process. Based on what you know about SN2 reactions, which of these two carbons is our methoxide going to attack? Okay, the one with the hydrogen. Why? Less substituted, less hindered. Exactly. So because it's SN2... Our nucleophile attacks the less substituted carbon of our epoxide. What do we know about the stereochemistry of that process? It's going to be inversion. Okay. We have an alkoxide or a negatively charged oxygen as our leaving group. Usually we don't do that because it is strongly basic. But the relief of the ring strain provides a thermodynamic driving force that allows us to use this strongly basic leaving group. Okay? OCH3. We'll draw our methyl group here. Uh, even though I've still got it pointing back, we've inverted it because originally we had a carbon oxygen bond from this carbon pointing to the upper left. Now we have a carbon oxygen bond pointing to the lower right. So that's the way we've inverted it. And because we've done it that way, we keep the orientation of the methyl group pointing back. Drawing the inversion of epoxides can be tricky sometimes. But this is not the final product of our reaction. We have this negatively charged oxygen. What we do is we then add water in a second step. Uh, and that water gets protonated or sorry, that water protonates the alkoxide, and we end up with an alcohol in our product, okay? Uh, it's important when we're writing these mechanisms uh, with, or, or writing out these reactions of epoxides to add the water in a second step, okay? to have that be 
the second step of the reaction. If you were to add the water simultaneously to the methoxide, you would just have an acid-base reaction between those two components. And so you would destroy your nucleophile before it had a chance to react. Uh, so because we're using strong nucleophiles that are often strong bases, we have to add the water in a second step. Okay. So what we would do, we would have, here's an epoxide. We would use sodium methoxide. Can I help you? Is your microphone not working or is it working now? Uh, I gotta call the it's working, so I'm not sure. Uh, uh, what the call was about. So, all right. So we add our methoxide first, our water second. In this this particular epoxide, is it chiral? Not chiral. There's a plane of symmetry. Okay. This is a chiral. It's a meso compound. Okay. So. Will our nucleophile attack the carbon on the left, the carbon on the right, or will there be no difference? No difference. It's going to attack both of those carbons with the same rate. So what we're going to end up with is a one-to-one -one mixture of the product where our nucleophile attacked from the left and where it attacked from the right. Okay. Is the product chiral? Yeah, uh, but it's going to be racemic. So the principle we learned from this is that achiral starting materials, or sorry, I meant to say optically inactive starting materials, optically inactive starting materials afford optically inactive products. So this is, we can convert achiral molecules into chiral molecules. That's possible. We've done that here. But it has the product has to be optically inactive, meaning it needs to be racemic if we've converted an achiral starting material into a chiral product. Question? Because this would encompass racemic compounds. If we had a racemic starting material and we converted it into a, a chiral product, it would be racemic as well. So this, this encompasses that example as well as what I've shown you here. So this is a specific example of a more general principle. That if you start with something that's optically inactive, you're going to get something that's optically inactive. Question, Morgan? No, that's a general principle. Although it's not completely general, because if you use a chiral catalyst, you can go against that. That's something we're going to learn in chapter 12. Okay? So in chapter 12, we'll make an addendum to this statement, which will say, unless you use a chiral catalyst. That's how you would generate a single enantiomer of a product from an achiral starting material. Okay? But for now, since we don't know about chiral catalysts, this principle will hold if we have an achiral or a racemic starting material, and we convert it into a chiral product, that chiral product will be formed as a racemic mixture. Okay? We'll stop there. I remember we have a quiz on Monday. Um, we have one more thing to talk about with epoxides before we go into chapter 10. Um, enjoy your Halloween, but please stay safe. Uh, we want you in class next week, not in quarantine. So uh, please make sure you stay safe.